This week in Biology 1440, we'll be doing an experiment that involves photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Hopefully you recall that uh, plants undergo both processes, but we tend to focus on photosynthesis when we talk about plants. Energy flows into the eco ecosystem in the form of light, is captured by the chloroplast, which then generates organic molecules as well as oxygen gas. Both of those are inputs for mitochondria. Mitochondria take organic molecules and oxygen and produce ATP. Meanwhile, they release carbon dioxide and water, which are also later inputs for chloroplasts. Um, and notice on this diagram that light is how energy enters into the ecosystem, and it leaves as heat because, as you probably know by now, uh, every time you have a transformation of energy, uh, some is lost as heat. Cellular respiration is that process by which we take food, and now in our bodies we chew it up, swallow it, and begin to break it down in our uh, digestive tract into macromolecules. Those macromolecules eventually make their way into your cells and then those macromolecules are uh, used to generate uh, ATP. The basic reaction for respiration uh, we see here following glucose as the uh, the molecule of, of the fuel. We have C6H2O6 plus oxygen, six oxygens, yields carbon dioxide, water, and of course ATP. Now we could uh, draw an arrow going the other direction and essentially then represent photosynthesis. The organism that we'll be studying this week is the same as we've been using for a few experiments this semester, the eukaryotic fungus known as yeast. It's a single cell fungus, um, has most of the same organelles that your cells have. And it's a uh, organism that is easy to grow in the lab and respires quite readily. So the first thing you're going to do is set up uh, the experiments on page 41 and you're going to keep an eye on them throughout the day and I, I would advise that you take pictures of them at the beginning uh, and at the end of the lab for your records. The first thing you're going to do is put about five mils of distilled water into a test tube and add around one to two drops of bromothymol blue. Uh, you want the water to be a light greenish blue color uh, but, but dark enough to see quite well. And you're going to use a straw. Do not suck on the straw, but you're going to blow into the fluid, be, being careful not to splash it on yourself, and observe what happens. Just so you know, bromothymol blue is a pH indicator, and at neutral pH, it's green. At uh, higher pHs, so more uh, alkaline pHs, it's going, you know, more basic pH, it's going to be uh, dark blue. And if it becomes acidic, it changes into a yellow color. And when you bubble carbon dioxide into a fluid, it tends to interact with water, forming a weak acid called carbonic acid. So you'll be able to tell when you've uh, bubbled in a lot of CO2 into that water because of the color change that you'll experience. So what you're going to do after that initial demonstration, uh, when you bubble in your own breath and do a test tube, is you're then going to design and implement an experiment using yeast. So use dry yeast to make a solution of bromothymol blue and water turn yellow, just like it did with your breath. You're going to design an experiment using the plant Elodea, the same plant we used in previous labs, to make a solution of bromothymol blue and water turn yellow. So trying to do the same thing that your breath did. You're also going to design and implement an experiment using Elodea to make the solution of bromothymol blue from the first experiment, where you blew in it, turn back to green or blue again. So you'll have to think about what conditions will be necessary to pull that off design the experiment as a table, and then implement them. Your second experiment, while your, your first set of experiments are running, 
is going to be a uh, probe based experiment using a carbon dioxide sensor and you are going to test the following concentrations of, uh, of, of solutes here. You're going to have 200 millimolar sucrose, that's sh table sugar, that's a fuel for yeast. You're going to have 200 millimolar mannitol. That's a sugar alcohol that is not easily metabolized. We're going to use it for our control because we need to remember if you step back and remember what we did weeks ago when we put a potato into different concentrations of sugar, we know that we can actually dehydrate a cell with a high concentration of sugar. Okay? So we're feeding yeast to sugar, but we have to, you know, we have to, to be sure that that concentration of solute isn't harmful to the yeast, or at least we control for that concentration of solute uh, so that we can compare apples to apples, if you will. So instead of putting yeast in pure water for a control, we will put them in a 200 millimolar mannitol solution so that they won't be able to eat the mannitol, but they will have the same osmotic balance as when they're placed in 200 millimolar sucrose. We're also going to test 200 millimolar citrate. Uh, that's an intermediate in the citric acid cycle. We're also going to eventually uh, test 400 uh, millimolar sucrose and 400 millimolar citrate at the same time, and I'll explain that in a moment. So you're going to do four different um, experiments here, uh, at, at least as a class, and we'll, depending on time, you may do all of them as a table, three replicates each, or you may end up doing a subset of those and compare class data at the end of the day. So what will happen is you will have a container, a flask, and you'll add three milliliters of your whatever solution you're testing to three milliliters of yeast solution, and you're going to let it incubate for five minutes. Just let it hang out, and uh, you know it'll start eating the sugar or reacting in whatever way it's going to react. And then you're going to place um, that yeast into the respiration chamber, insert the CO2 probe, and let it run for five minutes. Okay. And then you're going to get the slope. Um, now, I think we will probably, historically we've let it run for five minutes, but I think we could probably let it run for three and get pretty good data based on some experiments we did uh, on Friday. Um, so go ahead and let it uh, run for uh, three minutes and then get the slope of the last minute of data, unless your instructor tells you otherwise. And for that final uh, 400 millimolar sucrose and citrate uh, experiment, I'd like you to add 1.5 mil of, of sucrose, 400 millimolar sucrose, and 1.5 mils of 400 millimolar citrate uh, to three uh, milliliters of yeast. That way you can see what happens if they're both present in that test tube at the same time. Now, citrate is an intermediate in the citric acid cycle, so uh, acetyl coenzyme A enters into the cycle and interacts with oxaloacetate, forming citrate, which goes on to form isocitrate, etc., 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 right? You've probably seen this in lecture already. Um, but citrate being one of the first products, which is an intermediate product, it goes on to uh, become isocitrate, etc. But this is one of the chemicals we're adding uh, to the yeast in this experiment. Why? Because, according to your textbook, citrate inhibits phosphofructokinase, which is an enzyme in glycolysis. And so if it inhibits glycolysis, it should slow down, it probably won't stop, but it should slow down uh, cellular respiration, um, causing uh, this pathway to stop, which would mean we won't make as much pyruvate, which means there won't be as much pyruvate to go to become acetyl-CoA, to go into the citric acid cycle, to run the electron transport chain. Uh, so ultimately, there, there will be less carbon dioxide released from the citric acid cycle, uh, and we won't see as much of that, um, that product. So that's something to keep an eye on. A few tips about the probes this week. Do not get the sensors wet. They're really expensive, and they break when wet. Don't breathe on the sensors. Don't get them wet. Leave them in the stand whenever possible, which is probably the entire lab, and don't get them wet. Um, one thing I should tell you uh, before I move on is um, 
in between runs, if you have a lot of CO2 accumulated in the sensor, um, you can use a fan to blow the sensor out. Just leave it in the stand and blow air across the sensor to return it closer to ambient levels of carbon dioxide. Your instructor may modify this assignment a little bit, but this is generally what the assignment will be. You're going to turn in a lab summary, which will include your hypothesis as well as a figure. Um, it should also include a table of results of your color change experiment. Um, and you can attach photographs at the end of this summary to back up what you claim in your writing. Um, each photograph should have a very short caption just saying what it is, what experiment it was, and what color change you observed. And I would recommend then also uh, a short conclusion as well, interpreting everything that happened this week. And uh, here's an example of how you might start setting up a table like that for the color change experiment. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, make sure you work on that mass balance equation because if there's a quiz, I guarantee it'll have that. And uh, look over the pre-lab questions for um, both the respiration and photosynthesis chapters this week because uh, you, you may have a question or two from either either one of those, um, but we're going to focus on respiration for our probe experiment this week. <laughs>